Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. I'm back by popular demand. The inventory show returns, and we're starting our weekend with watches. Everything is for sale, and to reach out to purchase, team also at thewatchbox.com. Even if you just want to inquire about the price, that is your online concierge. We're also looking to build inventory for the holidays, so if you want to trade or sell a watch, maybe a two-way swap, maybe one for one, the same email address, tmasso at thewatchbox.com, is your source. All right, I'm going to start with an exciting timepiece that represents the best new dive watch of the year. This is a 40-millimeter titanium H. Moser & C. Pioneer rotating bezel. It is the Govberg Limited edition of 100. Now, what's interesting here is that it represents a couple of firsts for the Moser Pioneer sports watch. One, 40 millimeter case. Previously, these were 42.8. They were much larger. Two, titanium rather than steel. And of course, we now have solid blocks of ceramic-based loom acting as the indices on the dial. The watch is profoundly attractive with a media-blasted case profile that does a great job of hiding scratches, swirls, and marks. It's only 47 and roughly one half a millimeter from lug tip to lug tip. So you can wear this on a smaller wrist and it's just around 12 millimeters thick. So in terms of size and fit, this compares quite favorably to the Rolex Submariner. On my wrist, which is 16 centimeters in circumference, it sits low enough to fit underneath the cuff and it's narrow enough that I could recommend this for a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. And that is compounded by the lightness of the titanium. This watch sold out quickly, so it's uncommon to see them pre-owned, but I'm happy to be able to show you the watch at least a wonderfully crisp action to the bezel, which features a double knurling pattern, super sharp and easy to grip. You've got a 60 minute count up timer just by aligning the bezel with the minute hand. And fun fact, fully loomed bezel, which means it's easy to read the time in the dark. You can see we have those global light three-dimensional luminescent indices that stand proud of the dial. And then we have luminescent inserts inside of the bezel. Easy to read and easy to use the timing function in the dark. The watch includes a bracelet that is also titanium, also media blasted. Every single link is removable. And then we have the Brogioli push button incremental size system that gives you eight millimeters of incremental sizing via a rack system. And then internally we have Moser's HMC 200 magic lever bi-directional automatic movement with a three-day power reserve hacking seconds and a robust architecture with a full balance bridge and a free sprung balance for shock tolerance. It includes the company's distinctive double crested Cote de Genève and all of this is water resistant down to 120 meters so it is truly a diveable watch. You can see limited 100 pieces and by the way Moser makes every part of the movement including the tough stuff, the escapement, the balance and the hairspring. Taking a quick look at the watch end on you can see that it's relatively narrow in the look are surprisingly fine. So while this is a sports watch, you could very easily wear it full-time with office attire. All right, jumping to another blue-dialed 40-millimeter watch, but of a very different sensibility. This is the Rolex Oyster Perpetual Milgauss GVZ Blue. Before I jump this, however, let me remind you that each one of these has a skew. And what I'll do in this episode is I will show you the skew of each watch so you can easily reach out to team also at thewatchbox.com for pricing questions. Here, it's that seven-digit number at the base. So 474-3357, that's the SKU to refer to if you want to email me with questions. This watch came out in 2007 as the Milgauss GV, but it bowed as the Z-Blue in 2014, and it is easily the silliest, most charming, and most postmodern of Rolex watches. Now, it is actually what it claims to be. It's Milgauss and then some, and you can see this one has the original packing stickers on the side, so the owner probably had very little fun. You're going to get this watch in outstanding condition. Inside the 40 millimeter case, there's a soft iron cage that helps to channel magnetic field lines around the movement. That's one layer of anti-magnetic defense. The next is the niobium zirconium anti-magnetic hairspring. And finally, we have an anti-magnetic escapement. So this watch is 1,000 gauss anti-magnetic, but it might also be two, three, four thousand gauss anti-magnetic. It is substantially more than claimed. Blue dial by day, blue dial by night, Rolex's signature chromolite blue loom. And you can see we have that Z blue metallic sunburst dial with orange accents, the orange lightning bolt seconds hand, which, although it does seem a bit silly, is true to 1950s history. The original 1956 Milgauss did have that. And then we have applied white gold indices, white gold hands, white gold crown, and a green tinted crystal that is Rolex green. 13.2 millimeters thick. What's fascinating here is that this is the shortest end link profile you'll find on a Rolex watch. So the case is only... 48.9 millimeters from lug tip to lug tip, and then end link to end link, it's going to be about the same. 
on my wrist, which is 16 centimeters in circumference. It wears fairly easily and comfortably, low enough to fit underneath the cuff and narrow enough that I can recommend it for a 14 centimeter circumference wrist. It is 100 meters water resistant, automatic winding, chronometer certified, yes, anti-magnetic, but also shock resistant. And that 100 meter water resistance comes courtesy of a screw down twin lock Rolex crown. Taking a quick look at the skew for this one, you can see this Z blue has a skew of 4702700. -700. This is my favorite Rolex watch. This will be the first Rolex watch I buy, unless a white gold mint condition lapis lazuli dial. Rolex Date 8 Oyster Quartz suddenly materializes in my office. This is the one you can bet on. Let's jump to something that's maybe possibly a little bit more conventional, but no less memorable. From the Rolex catalog, this is an unusual take on a Datejust. 36mm Datejust 116200, we have a combination of tuxedo dial, roulette date, and domed bezel. These features in combination are extraordinarily unusual. And, again, pre-2012, Rolex used Super Luminova, so this one is abundantly loomed green. Now, the roulette date is a age-old Rolex feature that includes odds in red and evens in blacks. So that's how that works. You can see that you've got a quick set date, you've got hacking seconds, and you've got that tuxedo dial. You've got a sunburst silver center and a black lacquered hour track with white gold indices, white gold hands, white gold crown, 100 meters water resistant, 48 hour reserve, again shock resistant, and a chronometer. We've got an oyster bracelet here, and you can see that it includes an easy link tool free adjustment that Milgauss, you just saw, also has that feature. This watch is a late Z serial, so 2007 is when this watch was made. You can see it's an easy watch to wear, low enough to fit underneath the cuff, short enough that I'm actually not going to pronounce a lower limit for wearing this watch. This is suitable on men, women, even children. It's a great milestone watch to mark a special occasion in your life or in the life of a loved one or a friend. It's a great gift watch, and it's iconically Datejust. Remember, these features all came together over a relatively short period of time. 1926, the Oyster Water Resistant Case. 1931, the Perpetual Automatic Winding System. Combine the two in 19. 33 to create the Oyster Perpetual. The date just bows in 1945. It's an Oyster Perpetual with a jumping date that is always just relative to the position of the hands. And then in 1954, you got the Cyclops on magnifier. So that is a brief history of the date just right there. Now, let's say you want full bracelet, but you want to go way upscale. By the way, just take a quick look. The skew on this one. 4631-750. Full bracelet, way upscale, much more expensive, but you get what you pay for. Patek Philippe 5131-1P. This model came out in 2017. It was the swan song of the Cloisonne enamel dial 5131 World Time Watch. It's 39.5 millimeters in diameter and platinum, but it looks bigger due to the presence of the solid end links of the bracelet and this now discontinued crown guard structure that the 5231 does not have. It is all platinum, which means there's a diamond between the lugs, a top Vesselton diamond, that's what you see on a platinum Patek. We have a five-link factory platinum bracelet. The whole thing together weighs over 240 grams, and Patek avoids marring the dial with the city of origin and the maker's mark on the bezel rather than the case. Outboard, we have a world-time reference ring. You put your current city of reference up at 12 o'clock. So right now, for example, let me show you how this works. As you advance the time, clock time at center moves forward. That is clockwise, and then the reference ring moves counterclockwise. So in Los Angeles, you set your reference city at 12 o'clock, it is currently 3 in the morning. Now I can read that at the center, but I can also read it on the reference ring. I see 3, and it is 3, not 1500, so I know it's 3 in the morning, not 3 in the afternoon. And of course, we have semicircles, one in blue, one in silver, to give you a general idea of where it's day and where it's night. You look adjacent to the hour, and you can see the reference city. Really, that's backwards. You look adjacent to the city and you see the hour. So in Dubai, it's three in the afternoon. In Tokyo, you can see it's eight in the evening. In New York, it's six in the morning. That's how that works. Of course, you can jump the hour and the reference ring and the cities using a pusher over at 10 o'clock. So I can reset my reference city to Paris, à Paris. I now have the watch doing all of the math for me. As you can see, the reference ring, the city, and the hour hand jumps. This is the Louis Cotier World Time System, first debuted in the 1930s. Patek and Vacheron were the earliest clients for watchmaker Louis Cotier's system, and to this day, it really remains the standard for 
world time. 24 cities representing 24 principal time zones. That's how that works. And we have a cloisonne enamel dial. So the idea here is that we have a solid gold dial base and then vitreous paint, that is glass base, is applied up to 20 times in various thicknesses and in various different colors. And the little gold wires or cloisons are used to define the shape of the land masses. So it's enamel, but it's also cloisonne enamel. This was an application piece, which means you would have to submit a request, be approved to buy it, and then wait for it to be made, which is the nice thing about buying these pre-owned. You get them in great shape, full set, and there's no weight involved. Turn it all over. And since the late 70s, Patek Philippe's upscale movements have always been micro-rotor automatics. When an automatic was called for, center rotors were used for more mass-produced watches, and micro-rotors were used for deluxe pieces, generally complications. So this is caliber 240 HU Universel. It is a world-time movement module on top of a micro-rotor automatic base with a 48-hour power reserve. It has a free-sprung gyromax-style balance adjusted in six positions, an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, and the Patek Philippe seal. Combine all those features and you get a watch rated to no worse than minus three plus two seconds from the factory. So you get a accuracy attestation. Now the micro rotor means you can see the case back. It's, it's easy to see everything. There's no rotor or winding bridge to block your view and it keeps the watch thin like a manual wind. We'll go back real quick to that Moser I showed you earlier. And while the movement's attractive, you can also see it's substantially obscured. That is the advantage of a micro rotor. And if you're interested in this micro rotor, we have that skew right there, 4682084. I have long been a fan and collector of Jeger Le Coult, and the only JLC I've kept in my collection at the moment is one of their Memovox wrist alarms. There are two icons of Jeger Le Coult. One is the Reverso rotating watch, and the other is the Memovox wrist alarm. The first Memovox wrist alarm arrived in 1950 as the odd hinge lug reference 3150. What well, gained conventional lugs as the 3151 and JLC was off to the races, becoming the manufacturer of reference in wrist alarm watches. This is the Master Control Memovox as redesigned for 2020. It's the latest model, 40 millimeters in diameter in stainless steel. It features a wrist alarm that is loud enough to wake you up. And for me, that's always the acid test of an alarm wristwatch. We'll do a quick loom shot. You can see that the watch is actually quite well loomed and the little wedge index that indicates the current alarm setting, that is actually visible in the dark as well. Note that we have a polished inner bezel that creates the impression of double indices at the hours. Now the watch is 40 millimeters in diameter in stainless steel and it wears nicely. It actually borrows some design cues from the master ultra thin cases to create a more elegant profile on the wrist. And I think you could wear this watch on a wrist down to 14 centimeters circumference. The timepiece does resemble more than any other reference, the 1960s reference E11005. So while JLC says this is an homage to the Memovox watches of the 50s and 60s, it's really most like the E11005. Now the alarm is loud and vocal, and here's how you set it. By the way, we have a quick set system. You wind the alarm, you set the alarm, and you quick set the date using the crown at two o'clock. So turning in a counterclockwise direction, if you wanna activate one of the, these alarms to sound immediately, you turn the little index past the hour hand and you wait for it to jump. There it is, just like that. You can see the visible striker on the reverse side. And when fully wound, it will sound for about 20 seconds. Until the 90s, there were no display case back Memovox models. And even since then, it's been rare. Here you can see manufactured caliber 956. It's an automatic winder with a 40 five hour power reserve. And what's critical is the gong strikes against a hanging alarm, not just the case of the watch. So it creates more beautiful and more vocal alarm. Now you can also see that the Dauphine hands are half black polished and half frosted for contrast. There is a lot of fine detail on this watch. There are quick releases for the straps that allow you to remove the strap from the case, but also a quick release that allows you to quickly and easily remove the strap from the buckle. Push here, it pops right off. A very clever watch full of inventive thinking and a true classic of one of the great brands in watchmaking. Sticking with JLC, we have an extraordinarily rare watch right here. So, in 2007, Jeger Le Coult launched the Duomet a chronograph. Now, today, there are several Duomet models. None of them are solid dial chronographs, but all Duomet models amount to a few hundred watches a year at JLC. The company makes 100,000 watches a year, a few hundred Duomet. Of those, only a handful will be chronographs. 
Of those, none will be the solid dial duomets that launched with the original watch. Of those, none will be platinum. And of the platinum duomet that existed in the late 2000s, this white dial boutique edition was the scarcest, meaning this is an extraordinarily uncommon and collectible watch. It is also possibly the most impressive Jajero Lecoultre chronograph ever made, and it's one of the best by anyone. So 42 millimeters in diameter and platinum. You can see JLC welded on the lugs and then double finished the case. So you have both polish and satin finish adjacent. There were two versions of the Platinum Dual Met. One had a gray dial, the other was the boutique model with this white dial. It has an eggshell-like pebbly or sandpaper texture, you might say. It has parallel chronograph and time-telling functions on the same dial. So on this side, in white gold, we have the clock time and the power reserve for that clock time. We have coaxial chronograph and running seconds at center. We have a foudreon or lightning seconds hand that is associated with the chronograph, so it can measure to one-sixth of a second. Then we have coaxial, hands for chronograph hours and minutes, and a little scrolling single-digit minutes display. Of course, when you stop it and reset it, it's a wonderful piece of theater. Then we have two power reserves, both 50 hours, both manually wound. Turn the watch over, you can see those barrels. One winds while the other ratchets you wind with one crown. Two barrels, 50 hours each. This is the only chronograph I know of on which you can activate the chronograph and you will neither deplete the balance amplitude nor the power reserve. You double the power demand, but you also double the power supply. Caliber 380 is called a dual wing movement. Two different drivetrains, but with one escapement, which acts as a traffic cop, switching one on and turning the other off and then repeating the cycle in reverse. So it's literally two movements with two barrels, two drivetrains in one watch. The bridges are made of Maishor, which might not sound familiar, but Longo would call it German silver. It's that same nickel copper zinc alloy with the copper giving it its golden hue. We have Cote de Soleil, or sunbursts, stripes radiating out across the bridges. We have mirrored anglage of the finest grade, engine turning on the base plate, both black polished and blued screws. And I must say, this is the best finished JLC movement that is not a grand complication. You simply don't get this kind of JLC finish for under $100,000. There is a four peaked crenellated column wheel. You could see the chronograph reset hammer falling at center. And the movement, is free sprung and beating away at 21,600 vibrations per hour. It comes with a full deployant clasp, and fun fact, when JLC does a double deployant clasp, it's always in white gold. When it does single fold deployants on a platinum watch, it'll be platinum, and that's because white gold is not just harder than platinum, it is the hardest and the strongest of golds. This was my dream watch. I owned the white gold model for four years after saving up to buy it for four years, and I never regretted the money spent or the time. It was the most accurate mechanical watch I ever owned. It did everything JLC said it would do. If you're interested in living that dream, you could see the SKU for this one is 4721395. There was a golden era at Cartier between 2009 and 2015, and almost no one knows it happened. Carol Forestier, also known as Carol Forestier Casapi, joined Cartier in 1999. As a watchmaker, she became the head of movement development in 2005, and as her movements were getting ready to hit the market in 2008, the old Haute Horlogerie CPCP collection was discontinued, giving way to Cartier fine watchmaking. And between 2009 and 2015, Carol Forestier and her design team at Cartier's La Chaux de Fonds manufacturer ran rampant cranking out extraordinary watches with perpetual calendars, exotic tourbillons, minute repeaters, and more. And in 2010, they launched this, the 47 millimeter white gold Cartier Roton de Cartier Astro Tourbillon, a most unconventional tourbillon. Now, before I talk about the tourbillon, I heard you groan. 47 millimeters, well, let me explain. It fits on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist, which you could see well right here. The watch is 52.8 millimeters from lug to lug, and the lugs are short, so you might be able to pull it off, and it's thinner than you think. Jumping back to the watch itself, you can see that the tourbillon doesn't work like a normal tourbillon, because a normal tourbillon spins on the axis of the balance. Here, 
it beats away, driven by the third wheel of the movement, and it orbits the dial. It orbits the dial in order to change its orientation with respect to gravity and even out the effects of gravity. So instead of spinning, it moves in a 300 degree circuit, and it is a one minute tourbillon, so it doubles as the seconds hand of the watch. Art, you better believe it. On the reverse side, you can see this caliber 9451 manufacturer includes double solarized twin mainspring barrels, manual wind, it's a 48 hour power reserve. The Cote de Genève is gorgeous and so is the mirrored anglage on the bridges. All screws are black polished and the finishing on the tourbillon cage itself is even better than the case back. We have a rosette pattern outboard of a sunburst, silver sunburst hour track. Then inboard of that, you can see that there's a rosette pattern underneath a platform that bears the fired broadsword hands. And that has its own little rosette. This is a very special watch that shows great fidelity to Cartier history. The design conventions, yes, on the dial side, but also the buckle. This is an updated version of the deployant clasp that Louis Cartier designed in 1909, which was by decades the first folding clasp ever designed for a wristwatch. This watch came out in 2010. I've been doing this for eight years. This is the first example I've seen. It is an extraordinary opportunity to own one of the masterpieces from an all-time great modern era watchmaker. We talk a lot about Andreas Streller and the watches he's created for other brands. We talk a lot about Kerry Voudelainen, the watches he's created for others, such as Schwarz Etienne, Urban Jurgensen, as well as under his own name. We talk about the golden era of Ulysse Norden watchmaking under Ludwig Oxlin in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. But Carol Forestier deserves to be in that discussion. She gives up nothing to the boys while often contributing things that are different from anything they're making. And this watch is one of her masterpieces. Someday that will be recognized. But let's say minimalism is your ethic, but you still want something that's a handmade work of art. Well, some watches are big just to be big. Others, like that Astro Torbion and this Glasuta Original Senator, are vitrines for the handcrafts of their makers. And that is exactly what we have right here, an art gallery on your wrist. This is the Senator Handwound Skeleton, a model launched in 2014. It's 42 millimeters in diameter, but only 9.8 millimeters thick with a lovely vintage case design. It is an enormous art gallery for the caliber 4918, a manual wind movement with roots in the mid-1990s here, entirely skeletonized to open up the bridges and plates and then hand engraved. And you can see that a floral motif has been applied. We have banknote scrolling on some of the more slender components and then larger verdure. You can see the leaf pattern on the base plate. You can also appreciate that there is a lot of fine finish beyond the skeletonization and the engraving as every bridge edge has a mirrored anglage on its side. And that includes all of the hollows in between the skeletonized components. We have both black polished and blued screws. You can see the swan's neck, the stud holder, and the regulator are all black polished. And we have golden chaton holding pivot jewels fixed in place by blued screws, fired blued screws. So we have those lovely pocket watch evocative chaton. We also have a three-quarter bridge that you'll notice it at first glance, pocket watch style. It bears the barrel, the intermediate wheels for winding the barrel, and then the drivetrain as well. It's a 40-hour manual wind. And you can see that the ratchet wheel has double solarization on its top, but then its teeth have been black polished on their edge. And that's true of these intermediate winding wheels as well. You can see a black polished click adjacent to the ratchet wheel. That's so the movement doesn't run backwards as you wind it. It is spectacular and it's under 50 millimeters lug to lug, which means on the wrist it wears quite nicely. It is comfortable, it is flat, it'll fit on a smaller wrist. And you can see that this is a watch that's suitable for a wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference. I wouldn't go smaller than that, but this is a purposeful kind of size. It's not big for the sake of bombast or ego. It's large so that you have better access to more of what makes this watch great, and that is that skeletonized and engraved movement. On the dial side, you can see there is an engraved barrel with a sort of a grooved solarization. It's an unusual finish that I've never seen applied anywhere else on any other watch. All of the wheels are satinated. You can see the motion works center, the hour wheel bearing the hour hand being driven by the minute wheel pinion and the minute 
minute wheel underneath driving the cannon pinion. We have the keyless works consisting of steel components that have been satinated on their top, and you can see the clutch, the clutch spring, the crown wheel, the winding pinion, all of that's been hand finished where you can see it on the dial side. And the watch does have a full folding rose gold clasp. Here is the SKU for this watch, 4522165 if you're interested. I don't know if I showed you the SKU for the Cartier, so I'm gonna jump back real quick. There is the SKU. 4570008 if you are interested in the Astro Tourbillon. A lot of folks ask me, Tim, what's the most fine finish I can get for my money? And I usually recommend small dress watches. More often than not, I'm recommending high horology Vacheron and Audemars Piguet pieces from the 50s and 60s. But this watch launched in 2001, the Patrimony 81160 is cut from the same cloth. White gold, only 35 millimeters in diameter and 6.8 millimeters thick. You can see that upscale welded lug construction, which is sort of teasing what you'll find within. Now, this watch was one of the very last to use the a priori marks on the dial, which are these little signatures adjacent to Swiss. They're sometimes called Sigma dials. And this was encouraged by a Swiss precious metals trade organization in the 70s. Whenever a watch had white gold hands, indices, and numerals, they encouraged the brands to put that little symbol on the dial. Well, Vacheron was one of the very last to abandon that signature, which is why you still see it in the early 2000s. Now, on the reverse side, you get the main event, Caliber 1400, also launched in 2001. This this is a little giant and one of the best movements Vacheron has ever made. It was one of their first ever manufactured calibers. As for most of its 260 plus years of existence, Vacheron has not been a movement manufacturer. So this was one of their first swipes at making their own movement and they knocked it out of the park. Compared to more modern Vacheron calibers like the 2460 automatics and the larger 4400 manual wind, this is dominant in its superiority. Let me show you why. Let's see how close I can get. I don't want to corrupt this too much because the focus only gives me so much optical zoom. Um, it's actually electronic zoom, not optical. That's the problem. Take a look at this bridge. I have one, two, three, and then adjacent, a fourth interior angle where bevels meet. The bevels are broad, rounded, mirrored, and clearly finished by hand. The wheels here are internally chamfered, which means this is something you will not find on contemporary Vacheron movements. The inner circumference of the wheel, as well as the spokes, have been beveled, creating sharp interior angles where spokes meet inner rim. That's the kind of thing you expect to see on Grubel 4C. These interior angles, where we've got four of them in one tiny movement, you won't even see them on some Vacheron movements. The 2450 and 2460 automatics made today don't have even one sharp interior angle. You can also see the edge of the balance cock, where two bevels meet in a sharp outward angle, in a place where you'd barely even see it, but it's there all the same. You can see that the ratchet wheel features a solarization on its top. Now, you're going to need a loop to see this. The teeth of the ratchet wheel have been micro-beveled on their interiors. That is not something you'll find on watches below the grade of the Voodelainens, the Dufours, the Lang und Heine, the Grubel Forces. That is very, very special and not something you can expect to see on modern Vacherons. There's engine turning on the base plate, perfectly aligned Cote de Genève across the top. Screw heads are black poly polished with chamfered slots and circumference. We have a black polished stud holder, black polished regulator. Everything is superlative here. Geneva hallmark adjusted in five positions. The movement is only 20.65 millimeters in diameter, which is why you rarely see it on modern Vacheron watches. But it is the best of everything in one very compact place. The movement's only 2.6 millimeters thick. 40-hour manual wind power reserve. Good for him, her, or even a child. But this is no child's play. This is as finely finished as anything from the likes of Grubel 4C or Lang und Heine or the high-end watches of Alang und Zona and Patek Philippe. This deserves to be mentioned in the same breath. And more than any sports watch or complication, it's this type of watch that really registers Vacheron's claim to the status of Holy Trinity in the 21st century. There is the SKU 4634119. Let's bring in two masterpieces from pioneers of independent horology. Right here, we have a watch that was actually launched just after the Bulgari acquisition of Daniel Roth and Gerald Genta in 2000. So this is the reference 208 Datamax. It incorporates a lot of the signatures 
of Daniel Roth watch design. Now, he founded his company in 1988. From 1988 through 1994, he ran it himself. And he established some of these design conventions, including the Guilloche solid gold dial and the Ellipso Curve X case design. There were always two different levels of Daniel Roth watch, those with the manufacturing movements and those with high-grade customer calibers. And this is of the latter ilk. As you can see, a Girard Perigo 3100 ultra-thin automatic manual wind stop seconds quick set date 46 hour power reserve with a triple finished solid gold daniel rot rose lathe guilloche winding rotor you can see there's a lovely rayon pattern beautiful engine turning on the base plate the bevels are no joke here you can see just how beautifully mirror polished they are and then you have the gerard perigo double digit date system so gp does its double digit date a little differently with a sapphire disc over the base disc creating the impression that they are flush to each other you can also see all of the zeros on this dial have rot written right in there and because this is swiss french swiss watchmaking he is daniel rot not daniel roth david lee roth is roth this is daniel rot you can see the lovely open sixes and open nines and then when it jumps back Again, you see the name right inside the zero. Solid gold dial, several different guilloche patterns. There's a dental pattern orbiting the center dial, small seconds in the hour track. Then we have a sort of tapestry that runs down the center dial and also along the border, and then a vog or wave pattern for the small seconds. The watch is only 35 millimeters across, under 10 millimeters thick, and 41 millimeters from lug to lug, so it wears really, really nicely on a small wrist. This is the design legacy of Daniel Rolt. In this watch, we have a tiny piece that was part of a dying breed as Bulgari has toyed with the idea of bringing back Gerald Genta, but there's been not a word of Daniel Roth since at least 2012, and I don't see it being reborn. He's still practicing. Jean-Daniel Nicolas is his current brand, and if you send him his old watches, he'll still service them. This watch is very much the paradigm he established, the design ethic he established, and the look of the Daniel Roth brand that he established. So, very similar to Roger Dubuis, Roth was a pioneer in independent horology, and what we have here is the best of everything. This is a 34mm white gold sympathy by retrograde calendar with moon phase. So it has the first generation sympathy case with the outer shape that has this wonderful flowing form, but the cheaper second generation sympathy had a round dial, a round crystal, and a round inner bezel to be cheaper to manufacture. That was not a decision Roger made. That was a decision Carlos Diaz, his other founding partner, made. Well, these earlier models are far more collectible, and this was the New Millennium Special Edition with a signature dial. Now, you can see it as both Geneva Hallmark and Bulletin d'Observatoire. That is the Besançon Observatory in France. A full cased-up chronometer test of the assembled watch. And on the reverse side, you can see the Geneva Hallmark on the movement. It is a double barrel, hand-finished and highly modified Longines L990, doing business as the Roger Dubuis 5740. It has a 44-hour automatic winding power reserve and a bi-retrograde moon phase calendar module made by Roger Dubuis. So it's Geneva Hallmark, it's a chronometer, it's a one-year special edition, and it's the much-sought first-generation Sympathy in the 34-millimeter case. These all wear large. There's a 37, but that 37 wears huge because of the shape of the lugs, which are straight, thrusting, and unyielding. You want to buy a size smaller, which is why this 34 looks like a 36 or a 37, and it's the right size for my wrist. It's only about 45.5 millimeters from lug to lug. If you want to get into vintage Roger Bouy, you want to buy something from the late 90s, really no later than the year 2001, 2002, and this is generally considered to be the signature case design and the signature calendar design from the early Roger Dubuis company. Richemont took it in a different direction. The watches are bigger, more complicated. I don't doubt their quality, but I do doubt their appeal. This has a visceral, emotional appeal to a traditional watch collector. You can see the unusual finishing, a combination of polish and satin with vertical satin finishing along the sides and welded on lugs, as well as the complexity of that bezel design. And this watch has a rare feature from the period, which is a full folding Roger Dubuis factory deployment clasp with the company logo right on the buckle. 
Finally, the best watch, or at least my favorite watch I'm going to show you today, is one that is unfortunately sealed for your protection, not mine. Straight back from factory service, with factory service warranty, this is the Patek Philippe 5236P inline perpetual calendar. This came out last year. It's a 41.3 millimeter platinum case that uses the hallowed design from the vintage references 3448 and 3450. It's very similar in case design to the 5235 annual calendar, only A, this isn't a regulator, it's a lot easier to read the hands at center to tell the time, and B, this is a perpetual calendar with a linear calendar display, American style, day, double digit date, and month. This draws from the design of Patek Fleet perpetual calendar pocket watches made during the 70s. It's the first application on a wristwatch. You have two sets of coplanar coaxial discs, and this is all patented uh, to display this linear calendar. There's also a moon phase, a day-night indicator, a leap year indicator, and a lovely gradient blue dial that's light at the center, dark at the edge, and it has a vertical uh, satin finish, almost like brushed metal that flows from top to bottom. The watch is upgraded mechanically compared to the 5235, not just because this is a perpetual calendar, but because the gold micro rotor is replaced by platinum to improve the winding efficiency of the more power intensive complication and the mainspring is expanded to provide 20 percent more torque it also has a different architecture uh, with individual bridges leading down to the escapement giving the movement more sculptural beauty than the corresponding caliber 31260 reg in the 5235 so this 5236 is the best of everything it is my grail watch the one i want most the one i would most consider making a huge life change in order to be able to afford I probably won't be able to grab this one before you do, but I will make you this promise. If you buy this watch, I will make a custom tailored video walking you through everything this watch is and everything that makes it my personal favorite. If you're interested in being that guy, and for once I can say do be that guy, the SKU here is 4722856. For any watch in this show, reach out to tmaso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. Time out, Tim out. It's good to be back, and thanks for logging on.